Hey, how's it going? Mewtwo needs no introduction, and even if you don't know much about Pokemon, you probably know about this legendary's power level. Mewtwo has it all, and there's not much reason to dive into its stats, but instead I'd like to tell you a quick story about my personal first time realizing that Mewtwo was a thing. Now let's take it back decades ago to the 5th grade. Red and Blue had just released, and it hadn't really caught on yet. It was an innocent world before the rise of Pokemania, and a guy named Josh had this mysterious monster collection game. Now fast forward a week or two and everyone in class was playing it and since you couldn't just openly play your Game Boy in class, I found myself casually flipping through a very specific Nintendo Power Guide. I'd keep it spoiler free for myself but I just loved learning about Pokemon and there was a section that would show the power of each stat inside of a pentagonal diagram along with its typing, moves, where it was located, and all that good stuff. I'll never forget the first time that I made it to the very end and I was met with number 150. Mewtwo's pentagonal power chart was nearly filled all the way up. It was leaps and bounds above any other Pokemon. As I continued to play through the game, this super powered Pokemon was always on the back of my mind and I'll never forget the first time that I made my way into Cerulean Cave to get my very own. But like always guys, before the video begins, I'd like to quickly say that I do Pokemon challenge runs regularly and if this is of interest to you, consider subscribing if you are new to the channel. If you have any ideas, critiques, or questions, feel free to comment below and if you are someone who just never interacts or doesn't have anything to say just scroll down and type in clone cat below to help me break into the dreaded YouTube algorithm. Now with that said sit back grab yourself a sodi pop and let's finally see if Mewtwo is indeed the undisputed champion of the Kanto region. Like with all runs, I reset for some good DVs because, I'm not going to lie to you guys, I was a little obsessed with getting the best possible time and I could honestly say that I was a little nervous because I didn't want to mess it up. I wanted to see the full potential of Mewtwo and of course I nickname it OP because it's overpowered and off we go. One of the top things that Pokemon need in these types of solo challenges to compete at a top level is a lot of PP. The bigger the PP, the better the run and Mewtwo has tons. Swift and Confusion give you lots of moves to spam, but what gives Mewtwo the huge edge over any other run that I've done to this point is that it starts with Psychic. It's no secret that the Psychic typing is very dominant in Generation 1, but Mewtwo gets to start out with its strongest move and a supplementary stabbed Confusion just to make it all that much better. This means that I can stay away from Poke Centers for a long time and use that to progress, which is what made Nidal King so successful in its run, and in my opinion, this is one of the biggest factors in topping the how fast charts that I do. There's no need to do anything besides the minimum and after wrapping up the easy two battles, it's time for Brock. Geodude and Onyx's defense stats are often the difference in a lot of runs from being mediocre to being great, but it's no surprise that their low special, combined with Mewtwo having the highest special stat in the entire game, makes short work of this fight. I'm only level 6 going in, I don't break a sweat, and I walk out at level 8 ready to continue forward. And as I make my way to Mount Moon, I I'd like to talk a little bit about a couple of things. First is that I did multiple runs with Mewtwo. In one of them, I did utilize a strategy that you'll be familiar with if you watch or do speed runs yourself. It's called Red Bar, and it means that you just intentionally let your life get low to the red health. And this speeds up battles by shortening enemy cries and letting you do your inputs a little bit earlier, among other things. During my first run, I went to Red Bar during this section and stayed there as long as I could during the entire game. And as I progress, I'll try to provide some insight insight to the differences and to why I chose this run specifically and the overall time difference at the end of the run, but overall I chose not to do that run or do red bar in this run intentionally because mainly it's just a strategy that I haven't utilized in any other run and for the sake of keeping a, the playing field even, I didn't want to start with this run. Mewtwo is more than capable of standing within the confines of my rules already established and it certainly doesn't need any more advantages over the previous runs and that's just kind of my thought process for the most part and with that said there's not a lot of excitement overall in the run between the main battles so enjoy this background footage of Mewtwo just absolutely smacking anything that dares to get in its way. It's worth noting that I have not healed yet and when I make it to Cerulean we'll talk about that in a little bit of detail in a minute but I do make a mistake here. I go out of order and I could have optimized the run a little bit better but let's see what I actually do. The mistake here is that I go to Misty first. My mind kind of blanked and I just walked over here and I I didn't want to backtrack, I didn't want to waste any time because like I said, I was dead set on this run being perfect. 
So with that said, Misty beat me a lot. Legendary Pokemon in general are kind of looked upon as these stat monsters, but what is overlooked and unique about starting at a low level on these runs is that you can be very vulnerable when doing minimum battles and being underleveled. I'd like to reiterate that the optimal route is to do rival number two, proceed to Bill, and then take this on because each level up for Mewtwo, and the same goes for all legendary Pokemon, is that you just get so many stats when you level up and it makes such a huge difference. You can also see that I'm pretty perhaps a little bit overconfident here. My first attempt, I'm just at half health, and it's not the star you that's the problem. It's mono water type, it can be nuked down with psychic, but star me is very fast, and it's psychic typing resisting my best moves, it's just the recipe for some frustration. Taking this fight on at level 14 against a level 21 that resists my moves is an absolute blunder, and it would be costly if I was doing a speed run. You would assuredly just have to reset at that point, but in these sets of rules and the how fast runs, I could just retry as many times as it takes and at the end of the day it won't cost me any actual in-game time unless I have to leave and come back but that's not an option here we're gonna get this done and with all that said I feel like I'm making this seem worse than what it actually was I only failed five times but you only have to understand how much of an anomaly this is from YouTube because I'm barely gonna break a sweat for the rest of the run and losing a battle it only happens it's very rare for the rest of this run I'll say that so when it's all said and done, I hit some good luck. Mewtwo has excellent crit rate, but I cannot deny that two crits, along with a psychic special drop between them, is pretty low odds, but a win is a win, and if you wanted to see Mewtwo struggle just a little bit, you better enjoy it while it lasted. After the fight, I do get access to Bubble Beam. It's not great on paper, it's not the best move, but after doing a lot of crunching and test runs, it's actually pretty key to the success of the run. More importantly, I can replace Disable and now I have this gigantic pool of power points to play around with from here on out. It's also worth noting that I do heal here, and it's not because I need to, this is just because this is the most optimized route to anchor yourselves here so that you can use the escape rope back from Bill's house, and then later you can dig back from Vermilion, and it just saves a bunch of time. This is the only time in the game that Mewtwo will use a Pokemon Center, and that's just actually amazing. Now it's time to face rival number two, and I should have done this before Misty, but what's done is done, let's focus on the battle at hand and you'll notice that I'm not using psychic I'm not just blasting everything down and the main reason is that I'm not planning on healing like I mentioned previously I need to smartly use every power point because even if it slows me down a turn or two here or there the overall amount of time that I'm gonna save in the long run by not healing it just cannot be understated the battle itself isn't much of anything and I won't go over the fine details but I finish up the battle at level 17 I only lose five hit points and let's move on it's worth noting that I do one extra extra battle here, remember that for later, it doesn't take long, and my thinking was that in a run where you're not healing, PP is the enemy and it's the one finite resource that you need to manage, so picking up an extra elixir right here could really go a long way when it's all said and done. Now let's move ahead to the SSN and on to our next optional fight. I opt to get Body Slam and you might be thinking that this is a waste of time, but I assure you that everything in this run is pretty meticulously calculated and there will be a reason, but we'll get to that when it comes. There's also a third optional battle that I take on, it's the Gentleman guarding the Rare Candy. He has two weak fire types and I have Bubble Beam, so it's very fast, very easy, very quick. I skipped it on my test runs, but I decided that one extra level would smooth out the run overall. And if you don't agree with me about these optional battles or you've done this run yourself, you can comment down below. I'm very interested in opinions if those exist. Next up is rival number three. And the main takeaway of this fight is you might notice that I'm spamming Swift a lot here. And the main reason for that is that it's going to be replaced soon and I want to get as much use from it as I can. I do swap up and I use my very limited uses of Psychic on the main trainer's ace Pokemon like War Turtle. Once again, it's an easy fight. We're moving on very quick. And when it comes to Surge, you probably guessed that it's not going to be much of an issue. I squeeze as much juice as I can out of Swift, and that's really all there is to say about this fight. And afterwards, I do get Thunderbolt, and you guys know my opinion on this move. It's a must for elite level runs. My use of Swift the last several battles have led it to being replaced by this amazing coverage move, and this should set up Mewtwo for success as we inch closer to that mid game. From there, there's absolutely no reason to show the Rock Tunnel segment of the game, so let's pick up back in Celadon. Mewtwo's move pool is elite, so as expected, buying a fresh water and trading it to the little girl for Ice Beam is the first order of business. And while I'm in the area, I also spend all of my money by 
buying two calciums to give me that little extra special kick since I don't want to backtrack at all during the run. This was an optimization I made over my few practice runs and it works out pretty well in my opinion. I'd recommend it. From there I quickly head to the left of Celadon. I pick up fly immediately and I use it to fly back to Celadon to save even more time. It's something I normally don't show but rolling into Celadon Visiting the Pokemart for the water, grabbing fly, and then using it to fly back. It's just, it feels nice, it feels optimized, and I feel like I've used the word optimized too much at this point. Comment optimized down below. With business out of the way, it's time to get some things done, and for that, I opt to start at the Rocket Hideout. There's no need to do anything extra, and I immediately make my way to Giovanni number one. And in this fight, I don't hold Mewtwo back. I'm running out of power points, and I just let it run wild. I use Psychic, and I want to get to this fight as fast as possible. I'll be getting my PP back very shortly through the game's only free heal very soon. And here's a tiny clip of me digging out of the rocket hideout and going all the way back to Cerulean since it's the only time that I've healed. I'm just throwing it in to emphasize Mewtwo's dominance over all the other Pokemon to this point. Next up is rival number 4 and I lose this fight guys. I lose this fight. You might think that this is impossible, but there is a unique situation here. You see, I only have a single use of Psychic left, and that's it. I use it on the Pidgeotto, and then I'm on to Struggle Strats. It's not really anything to do with the battle itself, but more so just the recoil damage. I wanted to make it through this battle so bad, but I was just a little bit off. Honestly, it just amazes me that I was able to go from Rival Number 2, through the Nugget Bridge, down to Bill, down to Vermilion, fight Lieutenant Surge, go up through the Rocket Tunnel, take out the entire rocket hideout and then that's where this is where the PP reserves run out just thinking about that for a second it's kind of bonkers what I ended up having to do was to use an ether on psychic it works very well on this team outside of the Kadabra but overall it flows like much all the other rival fights and the battles in general to this point I would love to get past this using the struggle strats but that would just be wasting real life time at this point and I don't really need to stroke my ego that much I'm fine using the ether I usually end up with too many eyes items anyway. Moving on from there, I have one last battle with a channeler, and Psychic is super effective so it's not an issue. The meticulous planning of the run up to this point has led up to the one free heal in the Pokemon Tower that the game gives you. This is where I get to return all of our power points and return to full strength, and I'm looking to ride this all the way through to the end of the game. It felt very rewarding to plan this run out and have it work out as well as it did. It looks simple, but there was a lot of planning and a lot of work to make it to this point to this to be the exact point we run out of PP. Eventually I finish up the tower, I get the flute, and from there I skip Erica and make my way past the Snorlax towards Koga. And you might wonder why I would do that. Well honestly, I'm scared of that 100% critical rate of Victory Bell's Razor Leaf, and I feel much more comfortable taking on Koga, going ahead and getting that speed part of the badge boost to help me out. Down in Fuchsia, I immediately grab the final HMs from the Safari Zone, and once again, notice when I dig, I dig back to Cerulean. I just like to leave this in because after close to a year's worth of content that I've done, this is very unique to Mewtwo. To be at this stage in the game and warping back to where we were in the first 20 minutes of the game is just crazy, and I just want to keep it in. Koga's next, and it's a psychic type against a full team of poison types. This one is going to be a landslide victory and one of the easier fights in the game, and that's one of the main reasons I opted to go here first. The one interesting part is that this is the part of the game where I decided to exhaust my power points of confusion because I'm still using that and bubble beam in my move set which are both mid game moves and they will not be in our final move set I need to get as much mileage out of confusion as I can like I did with swift earlier I do end up using psychic on the wheezing because I'm poisoned I don't want to take the chance of getting hit with the self-destruct but it's pretty easy and ultimately I get that sweet speed badge boost and we're moving forward and that takes us back to Erica and since I'm not using ice beam yet I take a slightly different route I battle a different trainer usually I go for the one on the left that has the lone execute but this trainer has a team full of Pokemon that are weak to confusion which is what we want to get rid of and that's what I decide to do it seems a little convoluted but just trust me guys as for Erica psychic does the trick just fine with a speed badge boost from Koga and two of her three Pokemon being weak to the strongest psychic in the entire game it's three moves three deaths we're done it's a very easy but the alternative was to do this fight earlier and risk playing roulette against that scary razor leaf and I didn't want to do it. Next up it's time for Silphco and this is where runs usually get interesting. From here on out there's not many fights left in the game and these are the parts where Pokemon separate itself from the pack. 
I do the bare minimum and this allows me to exhaust the remaining power points of confusion and I can finally learn Ice Beam over that. This will allow us to handle several key Pokemon including the multiple eggs coming up. That brings us to rival number 5 and let's just dive into the fight and see how it plays out. First up is Pidgeot. I have multiple answers for it and I opt to go for a Thunderbolt. It's a one shot and we are on to the next. Next is Growlithe and while this isn't the reason I'm hanging on for Bubble Beam specifically, it does help in this situation and I do make short work of it. Execute is very annoying and this is the sole reason that I'm learning Ice Beam now. There's no doubt that I could slog through it eventually but turning it into a one shot instead is definitely the preferred method. As for Alakazam, I don't have an answer for it just yet. All I can do is throw Ice Beam at it but it's massive special means that it's a three shot. I go for Ice Beam mainly because it has the freeze chance but the only moves that it can throw back at me are resisted so it's not really an issue. It's just not that fast but it's all we have for now. Now it's the best we can do. Blastoise is last and this is a beefy turtle. One thunderbolt doesn't do the job but it just goes for a withdrawal and I'm able to finish it up on the following turn to take a fairly convincing battle. Mewtwo isn't quite at full strength yet but if this is what not being at full strength looks like then I'd say we're looking pretty good. I'm gonna skip ahead after Giovanni because it's a slaughter and instead let's go take a nice swift swim down to Cinnabar and you may have guessed that this is the main reason I'm hanging on to Bubble Beam. There's a rhyme and reason for the route that I'm doing and going to Blaine now with Bubble Beam just feels better. Although Psychic does do a great job, I just think that Bubble Beam performed better in my test. After everyone's favorite question and some Doomstoner brother, it's time to take on Blaine. Bubble Beam does a great job in this fight. Rapidash and Arcanine are not one shots, but Psychic wouldn't be either and I have just enough power points to make it to the end of the fight and I don't break too much of a sweat. I can definitely admit that hanging on to Bubble Beam this long is a little controversial but I remembered I tried multiple ways and I like this route a lot and the move combination performed very well overall. Once again if you feel different or if you have some thoughts let me know below. Sabrina is next and my careful use of Bubble Beam has left it exhausted and ready to be replaced with Body Slam that we picked up a lot earlier. This is key for those tough psychic Pokemon coming up in the final battles and this is one of the huge adjustments that I made in my strategy before I recorded this run after not being happy with the previous ones. We've been over how this fight goes without physical coverage moves like in the Alakazam run for example. Having Body Slam here and in some of the final fights really shines. Kadabra and Alakazam are very frail. They only take a single Body Slam to take out but Mr. Mime can take a hit but it's not much of a threat. I do have Psychic for Venomoth and overall it's a quick fight and the Body Slam adjustment really made this fight much faster than on the previous runs that I've tried. Now that's 7 badges down and we're on our way. By the time I make it to Giovanni for the final badge that means we only have seven battles between us and seeing how Mewtwo performs but first things first let's take a look at Giovanni. Mewtwo has an excellent move pool and Ice Beam really puts in work during this fight. It's super effective against this entire team but Psychic is still more useful against the Royal Nido family due to their poison typing. There's no surprises here and it was all but a formality that Mewtwo would just cruise through the gym badge portion of the game. Now let's look ahead at the final fights and that means rival number six is first which is usually a good litmus test for how you'll do in the Elite Four. I do have to use an Elixir here, but I have four and I have a max Elixir, so I have plenty to spare. Astute observers might notice that perhaps the extra Elixir I picked up at the start of the game was a waste, and I'd probably agree with that, but I'm not going to do this run a fourth time. The fight itself is pretty clean. You notice that I don't even bother healing if that tells you anything. I have super effective answers for most things. Pidgeot and Blastoise can get Thunderbolted, Rhyhorn and Execute can get Ice Beamed, Psychic is good enough for the Growlithe and I have Body Slam for the Alakazam but it's not at a one shot level at this point in time because honestly I'm seven levels lower but despite the huge level disadvantage I have it's just a nice display of Mewtwo's power level and I'm feeling pretty great as we wrap up this fight really easy and from there there's no battles I'm in a mad dash to make it towards the Elite Four I do skip the rare candy inside Victory Road because I realized that the first optional battle with the Elixir was a waste and I just wanted to save that time here if I could. Before the Elite Four starts, since Mewtwo has no badge boosting moves, there's no reason to not use all of the rare candies that I have and that gets us up to level 52. So let's see how our first attempts go. Lorelai is first and it's not surprising that Thunderbolt puts in some overtime here. I'm out leveled and Dugong can actually survive a Thunderbolt at low health. It could have been a range but I'm not sure. 
it does trigger a retroactive super potion and I do take it out in the next turn. Glacier is next and its special isn't that great so it only takes one Thunderbolt to move us on in the fight. Slowbro is also a tanky Pokemon but honestly Mewtwo just has that raw power and one Thunderbolt is enough to take it down in a single shot and that brings us to the Jinx. And Jinx is tanky in terms of special attacks. It's not weak to Thunderbolt so in this case I opt to use Body Slam. I'm not sure how much damage it would normally do, but I just get a crit and we it's one and done. The Lapras is all that's left, and we know Lapras is a good little tanky boy, so of course it can survive a Thunderbolt. The takeaway here is how little a stabbed Hydro Pump does due to Mewtwo's special stat, but outside of that, that's Lorelei down. Let's look ahead, and guys, it's time for Bruno. We know how psychic types do against Bruno in general. Even in the very weak execute run, I had a very easy time, so there's no question what what's going to happen here. There's no need to heal, there's no need for any strategy, there's no need for any deep dives, and there's no need to waste any more time with Bruno's bad vibes. We're moving on and that's final. Agatha's third and the only real concern I have here is if I can outspeed the first Gengar and avoid any shenanigans happening. And I do outspeed it and from there it's not a shock that Psychic takes it down in one hit. Things are looking pretty good. Golbat is weak to both Thunderbolt and Psychic. Haunter is slower than the first Gengar and Arbok is just Arbok. It's always going to be the weak link of Agatha's team. I don't break a sweat and I mow through those Pokemon onto the last Gengar and I actually outspeed it but Psychic just barely doesn't knock it out but it does get it into range for a retroactive super potion which means that this battle is over the next turn and honestly the last Gengar is never as bad as the first one since it doesn't have Hypnosis and it has Dream Eater for no reason. It has more chances of just wasting its turn but it's done. Lance is the penultimate fight and I'm not going to deep dive into this one. This is one of those runs where Lance is almost Bruno levels of easy. If you have Thunderbolt, if you have Ice Beam and a decent special, it's always an easy fight and Mewtwo is the king of special. Despite being out leveled, I do actually outspeed Aerodactyl which is impressive in its own right and kind of surprised me. There are a few runs that we've done where we actually outspeed Aerodactyl and once I saw that, there was no doubt that this battle was going to be over very shortly after. That leaves us with one fight left the champion fight it's tougher than the six rival fight but Mewtwo is also much stronger since we used our rare candies and we leveled up a couple of times. And let's see how clean Mewtwo can wrap this one up. Pidgeot is first, and we've seen this time and time again. I outspeed, I have my choice of moves, one shot with a Thunderbolt, it's done. Alakazam is next, and last time Body Slam was not a one shot. This time, I get a critical hit and we don't even get to see if I can take it out normally, and I don't want to find out. Rhydon is next, and Mewtwo's two box is deep, and I have Ice Beam just for this occasion, it's out. And Arcanine is always really thick, but Mewtwo is able to critically hit with the Psychic and take out the Arcanine and its massive dumpy without a second thought. We are cruising along into Executor, but Ice Beam isn't a one shot. Execute has a massive special stat, it's a very interesting Pokemon, but unfortunately in the champion fight, its moveset absolutely sucks dick. I take a stomp, and then we finish it off right after, and that takes us down to a 1v1. Blastoise is a beefy boy and it can take a single hit but for its turn it just uses bite for negligible damage and just like that a second thunderbolt finishes off the fight and that's it. It was an extremely clean and easy Elite Four with zero resets. In fact, my only resets came when I accidentally went to Misty too early, and then the one time I was stubborn and tried to use Struggle against Rival Number Four. Honestly, how hilarious is it that Rival Number Four was our only legitimate reset in the entire run? Anyways, I'm sure everyone wants to know how Mewtwo did, and let's not delay that any further. Mewtwo finishes with a level of 57, but more importantly, it crushes the previous best time with a two hour and 23 minute run. I'm extremely confident just like with Ghastly in the pre-evolve runs that Mewtwo just cannot be touched and I'm sure no one is really surprised here. It was a 15 minute improvement over Nidoking and honestly I could have probably saved another minute by skipping that first optional fight that wasn't needed. Outside of that I mentioned how much I really planned for this run and meticulously tried to get the best time I could and I'm happy with it overall. Before I close out I'd like to go back to my previous comments about other runs specifically the run where I did red bar a lot. During that run, I didn't have it fully optimized yet and I didn't do things like use body slam or hang on to bubble beam for Blaine and the run was actually one minute slower than this run. I'd imagine if I replicated this run along with the red bar strats, perhaps we could have a sub two hour and 20 minute run, but I'm not too worried about it. I'm happy with what we got. I'm not going to try anymore. Overall, 
I think this is the peak of Pokemon Red and Blue, and any future runs are just going to be chasing the impossibly high mark that both Ghastly and Mewtwo set. But it's still fun to try. There's always surprises. I'm thinking of Slowpoke or Nidoking. Those really came out of nowhere, so I'm interested to see what some of these other Pokemon can do in the future. But with that said, I've been messing around with Ruby and Sapphire, so you might see a different game soon. I figured it's time to branch out, maybe do some Gold and Silver, maybe do some Ruby and Sapphire. I'm not against the DS or the 3DS games, but honestly I just don't like setting up the dual screen when I'm editing, but we'll see how that goes. That's that's another thought for another day. So what did you guys think? Could I have done better? Would you do something different? Did it surprise you that Mewtwo dominated this hard, or were you just like me and you expected it? But I think that's going to do it for me guys. If you made it this far in the video, I, I really appreciate you, and I'll be seeing you guys in the next video. Bye!